have a TED talk by the end. It's amazing. Cool. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a, a fun series to watch. It's just. Hi, I'm Thomas Westbrook of Holy Kool Aid, and I took a left at the valley. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists. You know, we don't have non astrologers and all that. But with the religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith in unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. Why don't you after escaping Trump and Stan? This is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and they wanted to name some toilet paper brand after me, but I don't take crap from anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Joining me as usual is the team that found out why the universe is expanding. It's because it's trying to get away from us. And it will never escape. <laughs> as an assassin, she was an only child, eventually. Nancy. <laughs> Origin story. And then I fled for mercy because I was an orphan. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus could walk on water, but she can swim through land, Christina. Yep. Yeah, talk about that. <laughs> she killed two stones with one bird. Christina. I'm talented. You bet. Ladies, welcome back. <laughs> Hope you had a great week. It, it was actually pretty decent. It was, it was pretty good. It wasn't a bad week. I survived. Some ways. I survived a second civil war. Yes, I know. I know. I, I feel so bad for all our American listeners down there. You guys are facing the horrors of war. Yep. I provided aid <laughs> to our comrades in arms. <laughs> so today we'll be talking to uh, Scott. Who's we'll be talking to Scott knowledge. Marshall about his book, Love Explain Nancy. You're going to survive, my dear. No. <laughs> Isn't that true for all of us? <laughs> <laughs> but first, let's do a bit of chit chat. Well, you know when they get mini Trump in Ontario now. Don't talk about it, please. I want to. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to. Um, first thing he does, he goes in there and he fires the chief scientist. Yeah. What and, was his reasoning? And he's Why? also dismantling the cap and tree, the carbon trade emission system they have in Ontario. Yeah, he didn't waste any time. No, this is directly from Trump's book. Do you think, did his voters expect that? I mean, did they I don't expect think so. that the that he would immediately start into the denial um, factor by firing mm-hmm. scientists and people who really know what's going on? This is exactly like I said. It's from Trump's book. He's going to try to destroy everything the previous government did, even if it's a good thing. I can understand dismantling the stuff that you feel is bad, no. but when it's a good thing, leave it there. And but never mind, you know, it's like, oh, whatever the old government did, it's bad automatically. So he's going to start doing that. Uh, her name was uh, Molly Soichet, and she was appointed just in November last year. Wow. And then after that, he turns around and ends cooperation with Ottawa over the asylum seekers. Oh, yeah, this made me so mad. Well, this is the funny thing, I mean, is. Uh, the the Prime Minister Trudeau uh, and he basically uh, spoke with with him and he says um, Trudeau basically mentioned that the Premier seemed unaware of in, uh, our international obligations on refugees yeah and he says I attempted to reassure the Premier that asylum seekers the stream of asylum seekers is different from immigration and it is mm-hmm. you know somebody that's immigrating you know there's that's right they're we're, not seeking a, a we're refuge we're legally obligated to take in asylum seekers. And the worst part is these asylum seekers that have been pouring across the Quebec and Ontario border recently are because of Trump's policies. Yep. Yeah, the Haitians. The, the Haitians yeah. especially. Right? Like, oh, God. I'm shaking my head already at this doofus. I know. I mean, I really wonder whether or not the the Ontario voters are suddenly going to wake up from a bad dream and say, oh my God, what have we done? Or are they going to say, yay, it's about time we got another conservative in here? I'm I'm, I'm very disappointed that Ontario managed to put this idiot in there, but I'm hoping that they're going to wake up faster than our American cousins. And then they're stuck there. with them just the way we're stuck with he who will not be named. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But our parliamentary system is a bit different, so we might not be as tied down as the Americans seem to be right now. Well, speaking of stupidness, um, did you guys hear that Taco Bell was actually voted the best Mexican restaurant for 2018? Yes. No, I couldn't. I thought, <laughs> what? I mean, talk about dumbing down in, in 
restaurant tastes and, and you know going with a hundred percent pop culture. I guess that's okay. Who, First of all, I'm not even sure you voted can voted on it. I'm not even sure you can actually call that a restaurant to begin with. <laughs> this well, this it is a- ser- it serves food. They have cooks. They have tables. There's money exchanged, I guess, in a loose way. You can. It's you know, just absolutely amazing stuff. because this is a Harris poll, and they poll 77,000 people. Yeah. So it's not a small sample, right? Yeah. Well, and I, out of 3,000 brands, Taco Bell? Really? Well, Taco Bell? Are, are there any other Mexican restaurants that are all over? Because like, I'm assuming this is just in America. Yeah. Are there any other taco? Oh, not taco. There's um, a lot of ta- Mexican there's, restaurants. There's a that lot are, of Mexican restaurants. Oh no, no, no! But are there any other chain ones? Oh, yeah, of yeah. course. Okay. Oh, even oh, if yeah. even if you use the oh, fast food uh, ones like Taco Del Mar the, and well, and, uh, and uh, Don, Baja South and stuff like that. Yeah, there's Don Pancho yeah. and there's so yeah. because the, a lot of these people that voted probably that was the only Mexican restaurant. Oh no, no! I mean, they they're tons of them. I mean, Mexican food is, is just Way more than we have up here. Yeah, because I know yeah. we have, like, no Mexican food up yeah. here. Yeah, I know. We wish, I wish we kind of had a, a bit of And yeah. apparently the best chicken I restaurant mean, in the United States was supposed to be Chick-fil-A. Yeah. <laughs> what? God. Wow. Oh, my God. Trump and Stan. This uh, Trump and Stan, I tell you. It just... Now, to give it its due, Taco Bell has pretty good food. They really do. I mean, it's fast and it's 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 been around forever. Well, I but, call it the intestinal express because uh, <laughs> it goes through me real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've honestly never had it. Me neither. I'm not sure you're missing anything. No. Um, on... Well, I, I, I'm trying to think of how far back Taco Bell goes. I know they go back to the 70s, mm. it, but even so. You still know, remember those back... little commercials with a little chihuahua? Yeah. Don't quit or Taco Bell. Yeah, oh, no. I mean, <laughs> my, dog. Was so cool. believe me, I've had my share of Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> um, in uh, Christian love news, uh, at least one sister of the Missionaries of Charity. Oh, my God. This that's the so uh, charity founded by uh, oh. St. Mother Teresa. <coughs> Barf. Barf. Was arrested for involvement in the illegal trade of children. This makes me so upset. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, happening in Ranchi. This is a city in India. Uh, at least four children uh, were uh, uh, from unwed mothers were sold, and oh. for a fair number of rupees, uh, they, they've got one down. But apparently, there's at, le- at least a couple more. Well, so much for Christian love, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It's Christian love, all right? Their love of money. Yeah, exactly. I was yeah. just going to say when it comes to Christian love or money in your pocket. That's the way. They yeah, oh, it's disgusting. It's just the, the fact that the whole Mother Teresa thing. Anyway, I mean, I felt for the, I felt for the lie, the Mother Teresa lie. I felt for it that's for because the we time. didn't we didn't know we didn't the know. truth. We, we didn't know. We didn't really know. We we fell for the publicity we because totally we did. had no I, idea. As a, as a as a young person, I totally did. Yeah. Um, did you guys hear that Japan executed a cult leader? Remember that in 1995 they had a sarin gas attack in the <laughs> yeah, subway? Yeah, I totally remember that. <laughs> well, you might not. I wasn't well, alive. <laughs> that's making me feel old. <laughs> oh, well, this my. sarin gas attack killed 13 Carrying people. On. <laughs> this sarin gas attack killed 13 people. Uh, the guy's name was Soko Asahara. I know, Asahaka. He was one of 13 that was sentenced to death by hanging. Mm. And he just did. He hanged him and six others of his compatriot uh, last Friday. Mm. Uh, this was the cult of the Om Shrinkyo. And apparently they had 10,000 followers in Japan and apparently wow. about 30,000 30, uh, followers in Russia. Wow. So, yeah, He's they a had popular this, guy. Well, yeah. Pretty po- well, for, for a little cult, yeah, absolutely. So, and now he's dead. I, I had no idea that Japan had a uh, capital punishment. But apparently, no, I, it, it doesn't happen very often. Apparently, no, it, it it really doesn't. I mean, was he? I didn't read the whole story. Had he been in prison for quite a while, and then they oh, so yeah, they caught they caught a few, uh, I think, a few months after the attack yeah. in ninety five. So, so he's, he's been, been there, there for so it's taken a while. It's taken a while for them to get around to yeah. his execution. So, um, oh, this is uh, this is a story that uh, kind of makes me a bit, a bit angry. Did you guys hear that some heavily armed U.S. agents? Boarded Canadian fishing boats. Mm-hmm. I saw us like I saw the article, but I hadn't actually read it. Yeah, this is near yeah. the uh, Machias Seal Island, which is between New Brunswick and Maine. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, as far as the Canadian government is concerned, these, these are Canadian waters, but the U.S. government disputes. Uh, uh, there's a 165 square kilometer disputed gray zone between our two countries, um, and uh, these these. 
they just decide to come in and just come in with their guns and all that. They just boarded that ship and started harassing the fishermen, saying they were looking for illegal immigrants. What? Um, yeah. From where? America? <laughs> From Canada, no, I guess. I, no, I guess they... We would be taking their illegal immigrants. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, immigrants just... don't want to come from Canada to America. It, That's no. just stupid. It, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult story, you know, from a lot of perspectives, because have they got border agents who are just exercising their muscle for no particular reason? I think that's what it is. And they, it's and harassment. It's overreach, or... Yeah. Is it Homeland Security that's saying, you know, we're concentrating on the Mexican border, but there may be a few people who are coming in, so let's make it known to the Canadians that we're not going to tolerate this? Yeah. Or is it just, we do this all the time and the Canadians are just making a big deal out of it? It's hard to tell from the story because the first part of the story seemed as though it really was an encroachment, and the more you read, the more you said, well, you know... Well, apparently... Uh, you know, Think that's overreached. Apparently, anyway. there's been always some healthy competition between yeah. U.S. and Canadian fishermen in that area. Right. But it's always been, they've always kind of cooperated with each right. other. Apparently, the area is uh, rich in, in the lobster. Mm-hmm. But now, for a U.S. vessel to just come in with almost guns blazing, if you wish, uh, and I think that's just intimidation. It's an intimidation I think technique. so. That, that, that's uh, my feeling, too. It's just, it's just yeah, and I, I think it's totally unwarranted. And it's certainly not helping the relations that we have between our countries, which is. At its lowest it has been since 1812, yeah. probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> probably. Yeah. So. Well, you know, can, Canada is a national threat. Yeah, it's we're a national, national threat, threat, right? Mm. We're totally a national yeah. threat, obviously. And a fun little story at the end. Did you guys hear about the inflatable baby <gasps> Trump? Yes! Oh. <laughs> this, they had a, me so happy. Trump's supposed to go to London next week, right? And so they they bought they, they had a GoFundMe and they bought essentially a was it between twenty and thirty feet balloon of baby Trump in oh, diaper and he's I got tiny hands he's got a tiny hand and a tiny phone in his hand oh. and they they have permission from the mayor to fly the balloon over London and over Parliament ah. when Trump is supposed to visit. Oh, I hope oh. he enjoys it. Oh, yeah. that is golden. Yeah. But now the latest news is apparently Trump's schedule has sort of changed. <laughs> So now he's not really going to spend that much time in London at all. He's going to go almost. He's going to make a quick stop and then go to Scotland apparently. Mm-hmm. And it's he might, probably because it, of the balloon. It might happen actually during the night too, <laughs> so that he might not even be able to see the balloon. Well, just, <laughs> so you know, he's 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 done so much damage already. He doesn't have to stay in any one place for a long time because he's already. He's, it, it's a matter of he just gives everybody the finger and leaves. Yeah. Right. I mean that's about it at this point. Yeah, exactly. So, it's, so. It, it, it's interesting nonetheless. Anyway, moving on, my dear Nancy, you got a top ten for us? Sort of. Sort of? <laughs> well, I think what we started a couple months ago, I think, is kind of fun when it stops being fun. <laughs> <But> <laughs> We'll do something else. But I really think this is fun in that there are always holidays that you never hear about. We hear about, um, you know, uh, the 4th of July and Thanksgiving and um, BC Day and all of that kind of stuff. But there's always little holidays that are fun to pull out for drinking games and just, you know, toasting the, the uh, to- toasting the good things in life or the funny things in life just for a little getaway. So here are some holidays in July that if you'd like to celebrate or you know like to raise a glass you know to to its honor that's great and the first one in july is international blondie and deborah harry month what yeah i know i don't even interested? blondie no. and, De- <laughs> and debbie harry right i have no those idea are back, that those are that goes back for a while but you know you can always pull it out it's a good conversation sure. starter and it's national deli sandwich month Oh, Who really? doesn't like a good deli yeah, sandwich? Yeah, exactly. Right? I do that. Absolutely. Mustard, mayonnaise, uh, pickles, everything. Mm-hmm. So it's always good to celebrate a, a national. Now I'm hungry. This is one I had fun with <laughs> when I read it. It's also National Child Centered Divorce Month. Huh. Does that mean that when a child gets divorced, you get Or you divorce self- your child. Or, do, or you divorce your child. You know, I'm tired of these kids. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Moving out. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are on your own. That's well. right. America does still have some child marriages going on, so... I mean, I, I guess... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's a good threat. I'm going to divorce you unless you get, you know, get into bed. You know what the then best... you'll have to drive yourself to daycare. You know what the best <laughs> threat for a kid is? Oh, which one? It's quite simple. You film the birth, 
okay? Oh. And then when the kid misbehaves, you play the birth in reverse. <laughs> I'll send you back yeah. where you came from, kid. <laughs> That's traumatizing. I don't know. I want to unsee that one. In the universe, one of the things I'd rather unsee. <laughs> Moving on, it's National Dog House Repair Month. Oh, <gasps> you got a dog house? This is yeah, the guys, go fix your dog houses. Your I've dog th- needs. Yeah, I've been thinking a of nice putting a second place. level on the dog house. Putting on a and if your dog level. doesn't have one, go build them one. Yeah, <laughs> put, put in a, a little porch. treat room. Put in. Little, little condo, little you know. windows, condo. little flower box. Yeah, little TVs, you know, to, to watch <laughs> kitties. You know, the old dog play. channel on TV. Yeah. Um, it's national. Here we go, horseradish month. Horseradish month. Yeah. I was about to get really excited. Yeah, and then you said radish. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> Anybody a fan of horseradish at all? Or well, is it not a it's good, I guess. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, there's a, it's 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 not one of the top two or three condiments, so maybe we could elevate it during maybe, the month maybe. of July. It's is- a great prank to play on kids too, because look, he looks like green icing. Yeah. And he just gave him a scoop. Say, hey, you want to see <laughs> that green icing? <laughs> Is that like giving the kid a t- the teaspoon I, of vanilla? It smells great, but it tastes terrible. I had a traumatizing childhood. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Moving on to a different food. This is a good one. It's National Hot Dog Month. Of yeah, didn't that guy in the U.S. just down, what, 64, 65 of them? In I a, think holy the, re- shit. the record is 72. Yeah. 72? 72 hot, hot dogs. dogs. Yeah. In how Nathan's? long? Now, what size of hot dog were we talking? Are we talking about like no, the Nathan. tiny little ones no, no, or like a decent hot regular, size hot dog? Regular hot dog. Regular. And they're Nathan's hot. Anybody ever have a Nathan's how, hot how dog? How long really did good. he eat them in? Pardon? How long did it take him to eat these, man? Um, I think they give them a time limit. Yeah, I think, I think it's it like a... Three minutes, four minutes, uh, I minutes. don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty short. It's less than 10... It's I think show. it's like less than 10 minutes. Wow. Yeah. That is both impressive and disgusting. It is disgusting because they, half the time when they do those co- uh, competitions, they actually, have, especially for the bread, they dunk it in water. Yeah. So it becomes yeah. kind of like all Mushy. like a paste Ugh. and it goes down faster it, and takes less space. It's, it's, it's not so much it's that, it's the practice expand. that goes oh, in. But know, how well, many well, times well. do they have to just, or do they just think, no, I can do this and they don't practice? I don't know. There's, I know there's I a know. skill to it. 72 yeah. hot dogs like that and you're about to have yeah. cancer the next day. Okay, it's also <laughs> Smart Irrigation Month. Is there Ooh, is there smart, dumb irrigation? Yeah. Yes. So that you have to have a Smart Irrigation Month yes. to overcome it? Trust me, you can be stupid with how you set up your irrigation system. Yes. Okay. Have yeah. you irrigated where you know? Uh-huh. No. Oh. But I've I you can I've seen things that are just like oh, oh. Nancy, I've seen things. You you helped build the <laughs> Roman aqueducts at the time. I mean they've they've had some smart irrigation back then. Smart so. irrigation. Absolutely. Have they gone better than since? <laughs> Some of it is still around. It's Some so of it smart. is still around, exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go for the little kids. It's Get Ready for Kindergarten Month. Oh. Whoa. Wait a minute. Shouldn't that, that be like... August? August, yeah. yeah. Yep, it's some, in some school districts, school starts in August. So. Right, oh, really? America, I'm pretty sure, starts in August. They do, really? they start, I think, yeah. the end, of, the end yeah. of August. It's because we have the weird thing where it goes with, like, the farmer kids and, like, the harvest yeah, yeah, and that. The so you have right. to have the summers off and you start in the fall. Same thing with Thanksgiving, right? That's what we yeah. have. The world thinks it's weird. And I guess for little kids for kindergarten, it's really exciting to go get all of the, the little backpack and, yeah. and all their clothes and everything is really great until the first day comes and they realize mommy's leaving them there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, just a note on the backpacks for these kindergartners. Have you ever seen some of them? They're literally the size or bigger than the child. <laughs> you could fit like three children in one backpack. That's I, ridiculous. I could so see you with a Hello Kitty backpack. I could so yeah. see you with that. I had a Disney. Transformers. I had a Disney princess backpack. Thank you very much. You had a Disney. <laughs> now, you just killed two stones with one bird, and you had a Disney <laughs> princess backpack. Now she's damn straight. Bummer. It was pink too. <laughs> Okay, and it's Air Conditioning Appreciation Month. Oh, oh my God. God, I am taking full yeah. appreciation of that and one. We, we don't yeah. have air conditioning. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, but sure. I work outside, and every time I walk into the store, I go, huh. Oh. I, yeah. I work in a barn. Yeah, but we, you get a big-ass fan. Yeah, it's not air conditioning, though. Yeah, but yeah. you get a big-ass fan. I don't even get a fan. The problem is, in some places, air conditioning... <laughs> goes down to what two degrees or something like really? that and then i gotta go out and get warm so i can appreciate <laughs> that it. would be my grandma's house <laughs> okay and finally this is a really good one it's a fun one national 
anti-boredom month. <gasps> I like Ooh, it. I like, it. I like it. it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Celebrate your anti-boredom by listening to this podcast. There, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Guaranteed to cure boredom you know, in 90 minutes or less. Well, it works for us anyway. <laughs> and also guaranteed to make you question your sanity. <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. <laughs> Even more important. So there you go. You've got a, you've got a bunch of fun holidays to deal with in July and by the time you're tired of them it'll be August and we'll start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> oh that was good thank I you Nancy Na- thank you uh, before we <laughs> go to our uh, usual segment of uh, another brilliant moment I thought we'd do another one of we always love call things that make you go let's have a little chat here because we started the show with this but we didn't quite elaborate Ah, there is a civil war going on in the States, apparently. Uh-huh. You guys knew about this, right? That's right. Do we, Heck yeah. We needed, we needed the first one. Was I, I always before. listen to Alex Jones. <laughs> According to a very reliable source, <laughs> Alex Jones. Oh, my God. And there's something that, you know, sometimes the Internet, you know, people get kind of weird about the Internet. And they say, oh, you know, these things, you know, are you shouldn't listen to what happens to the Internet. But I just love the way they reacted to this. What happened is that Alex Jones essentially sent a, a Twitter um, on July 4th, which was their national holiday in the States, uh, saying, uh, basically, the Democrats are planning to launch a civil war <laughs> on July 4th. And... Twitter just lost it, and they've been essentially <laughs> quoting some what they call the um, hashtag Second Civil War letters, <laughs> and I thought that we'd quote a few, you know, as good reporters, would bring some correspondence from the front. Front line, yeah, from the front line. Reporting. So let me, let me set, a, set the mood here, because, you know, I think that's, this is important. <laughs> Because we don't want We this. don't want it to be lost into history. Yeah. That's it has right. to be kept for posterity. Because the war's been going on here. <laughs> so, dear Ma and Pa, it's day two of the Second Civil War. My comrades and I have set up camp in a library. There's absolutely no chance they will find us there. Love, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's got another letter? Okay, I'll go next. <clears throat> My dearest, at first we were scared of the enemy, but then we realized their trajectory map was based on Earth being flat. We relaxed. Their shooting has fallen woefully short for days, and yet they refuse to recalculate. With love, <laughs> Derek. <laughs> uh. Okay, I'll 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 do one. <clears throat> While this war has been tiresome, I don't expect it to last. Red Hat casualties are mounting. They choose not to treat the wounded brethren. Instead, they just scream, I'm not paying for your health care. <laughs> oh, and man. leave them to be dead. All right. Dear sister, I am safe. We were attacked by a group of red caps armed with unsolicited dick pics. <laughs> but once we rejected them, they fled, shouting that we were ugly bitches who no one would want to fuck anyway. <laughs> Fort male ego may be weaker than suspected. <laughs> Fort male ego. <laughs> Sis, several female red hats were taken prisoner today during a raid. They suffered so badly from smoky eye we could barely stand to look at them. Our medics tried, but our dwindling supply of Neutrogena was not enough to save them. War is ugly, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, this literally got me through oh, a this, couple days. <laughs> this is so funny, and I... Yeah, this may be the best civil war ever. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I highly recommend people go there and... It, Take a look at Twitter, Second Civil War Letters, and it's just absolutely precious. Yeah, it'll be the only Civil War that only had letters. There's no yes. <laughs> nothing else for posterity except these wonderful letters. So, That's great. so do we know, like, what Alex Jones thought of this? We, I'm I, so I haven't curious. Seen, I haven't seen yet, but you know what? If this puts a kink in his reputation, good. Well, it is It's the about freaking time. You can't look at Alex Jones as a rational human being and not laugh. 
No, I just, know that, but like, you know, he still has a huge oh, following. Oh, I know. Just because my, we mock him. My parents enjoy him. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, I, I mean, this is the. I guess this is the time to ask these people that follow Alex Jones. Hey. Where's that second civil war you were yeah. talking about, right? Where, or, why aren't why aren't why didn't Obama put us in FEMA camps, guys? Yeah, yeah. Where, where did that go? Where did huh? that go? <laughs> Wasn't he supposed to come for all your guns? I thought he was. I thought he was gonna to make it so that he would just be president forever. Yeah, and what it, happened to that? You know, it, it would have been the perfect time for it to happen. I think if anyone does the president forever, I think we know who's gonna do it. Exactly. Yeah. What about uh, Obama's ACLU Negro Army? Oh, where totally. where did that go? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are they fighting in the Civil War too? As the regiment of Negroes or something? It's like, what the hell? It's yep. it's it's. it's mind-boggling that these people are thinking that way but you know <laughs> i guess what we can do is laugh about it because it is so ridiculous at some point. your male it's, it's really, hormone it's, or your your male enhancement <laughs> yeah i just i just think it's a great that the resistance you know the humorous resistance yes. came so fast yes. i mean it's it's really what keeps us sane and what says you know they may be evil but there's an absurdity here, and if we deal with that, at least we can maintain some level of sanity or something. Like the uh, late, great Christopher Hitchens used to say, you know, laughter is the beginning of emancipation. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly. exactly what we need. We need this now more than ever. They need to be laughed at. They, they, we they, do. They we do. do. They need to laugh. Yeah, yeah, and we need to. Anyway, so. Make it funny and and you encourage that and send your civil war stories. <laughs> I'm it will to, be known as the war of the letters. We, yeah, we, yes, exactly. we, we should send one from our from our, the Canadian shores. You know, uh, dear dear John, um, refugees <laughs> from the U.S. are coming pouring north of the border. <laughs> we are taking them in with open arms. Yes, <laughs> We're taking them in with open arms. They're traumatized. I can see them scarred yeah. in their face. The red the red hat letters. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a porn? Oh, was it? Uh, oh, or is it they're just the red letters? I don't know. <laughs> well, the problem is these aren't the red. These letters aren't from the red hats. Like we're fighting the red. Hats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my dear, my dear, Kristen, do you have another brilliant moment for us? I sure do. Brought to you by religion. All right. End Times prepper Pastor Jim Baker dedicated an entire episode of his television show to pitching his new line of survival coffee. Oh. Telling his audience that things will get so desperate when the last days arrive that those who are prepared will be able to get a new car in exchange for one packet of this coffee. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but there won't be any gas to put in the car. What's the point of getting a new... Well, first of all, the, the end times, there's not going to be new cars. Uh, just, just you're you're at a DMV and there's just like rain, fire falling down. You're like, nah, but it doesn't have a skylight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute. You or have sunroof. A, is that a Porsche? If you have a dark roast coffee, do you get a Porsche or do you get an Audi or something? <laughs> Uh, You're I just trying to decide if you want the little foot touch thing to open the back. <laughs> it doesn't have heated seats. I'm not taking it. <laughs> oh, you don't need heated seats. You have magma falling from the sky. Yeah, the end times, man. <laughs> Citing the passage in the Bible in which in which Joseph was put in charge of Pharaoh's palace in oh. order to prepare for a coming famine, Baker reiterated that or reiterated his claim that God made Donald Trump president in order to give Christians an opportunity to prepare for the end times by buying Baker's survival products. It's really interesting how like doomsday preachers literally no matter what happens they just twist everything and yes Yes. This leads to the end times. Ten years say later, it's, this leads to the end times. It's been the end t- According to Christians, it's been the end times now for two thousand years. Yeah, I mean, Jesus it's, it's, himself it's, it's, was like, yeah. "The world's ending tomorrow, guys." <laughs> Yeah, and it's amazing how it always leads to a really good business opportunity. Uh, it's amazing. I'm, I'm sure Jesus probably sold that kind of food, too. Hey, Absolutely. Doomsday bucket. The kingdom of God is coming in your lifetime, he said. Yeah, it's coming in your lifetime. It's a freaking all lifetime. Of course, Nancy. Maybe it's Nancy's lifetime. That's why. Exactly. That's why. Uh, Nancy, we must protect you. Yes. <laughs> All right. If Nancy passes away, that's when the end times happen. Yeah, that's totally. when you'll that's hear it. the trumpet and everything. Yes, yes. That's, that's that'll be the real, the, <laughs> the real deal. Is that's Nancy going to be the fire breathing Jew? Yeah. Fire, <laughs> is a fire breathing Jew? Why not? Yeah, in the end times there are two fire breathing Jews. I don't remember seeing that. I yeah, don't. it's amazing. I don't either. And I'm have you it. not read your Bible? You like spicy food, Kevin? No, no, no. Have you not read your Bible? I have read the Bible, but I don't recall that passage. 
It's it's in Revelations. Oh, it's I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it was there. It's with the seven-headed New to me. So dragon if, thing. So if Nancy starts <laughs> eating spicy foods, we know. Run. It's a sign of the end. <laughs> So I've, I've got to start to, 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 to justify the whole end times. I've got to yeah. start eating spicy, spicy foods, foods and, and breathe fire. The fire breathing Jew. Yes. You'll go from the wandering Jew to the fire breathing Jew. Uh, <laughs> let's, go back, let's go back to the coffee. <laughs> I like the coffee better. <laughs> God has spoken to us to prepare for what's coming, he said. I believe Donald Trump was given by God to give us a respite and give us a time of prosperity. Do you think the evil Antichrist spirit is sitting back? They're fighting tooth and toenail. They're fighting the president. They want to kill him. And believe me, if they get one open shot, someone will kill our president. Um, do you see... We don't need to shoot him. We just need to hand him more cheeseburgers. (laughs) (laughs) When the end times arrive, Baker said, a bucket of coffee is going to be worth its weight in gold. Yeah, it's all probably worth its weight in gold now at the price he's selling is it, is, it, is it called End Times Coffee? I don't or? know what it's actually called. All <laughs> right. Armageddon oh. blend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that is worth if the sun don't shine, he asks. What will it be worth if the power goes out and there's no truck running due to yeah. an a- EMP bomb or whatever they're talking you know, about the for these sun, last day events? If the sun don't shine, your coffee's not going to be worth shit anyway. Because we're because all literally <laughs> going to done. be dead. <laughs> this two-gallon bucket of packs of coffee, two gallon? you could trade them for whatsoever you want. You could probably get a new car for one packet of coffee. Now, I've got to ask a couple questions here. One, are these like the size of hot chocolate packets because if so I'm going to need like at least two per cup two it's a two gallon bucket of it's coffee. a two gallon bucket of packs of coffee <gasps> oh and I'm like oh oh, and then God, also that bastard why is air packets? stuffing why packets <laughs> why not just a two gallon bucket of coffee because well, he it, wants it, to put less coffee in it well that duh dick well I guess it's preso- each little packet I guess is is um, anti-moisture and you know, if it's not same horns, I'm not drinking. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay, it's so that in the end times when we have no light, you need something to light your fire. So you got little paper from the packet, <gasps> okay, that's and smart. then you put your coffee, and then you can light the paper, and then you can make your coffee. Done. <laughs> Solved it. You're, you're genius. Thank you. Does Comes he, with a built-in fire starter. Does, <laughs> if, if you buy, if you buy two two-gallon packs, do you get a free percolator? To Hopefully, go along with it. <laughs> yeah. that would be nice. now, now, now exactly. Like, what kind of coffee is it? Is it drip coffee? Is it French press? Is it That's Keurig right. coffee? The, How do we know? Then you realize that your coffee maker <laughs> needs to be plugged in, and there's no electricity. <laughs> oh, jeez, what was the point? Then you get one of those like the the like bicycle thingies that you run, and it creates electricity. You just plug it in no, I guess you'd you'd have one of those campfire. Yeah. You know, yeah. What if he sells a double double blend for coffee? Double double. No, I French vanilla all the way. <laughs> now has anybody I like tasted this coffee? Co- I mean, are there it, any reviews? Because if the coffee is like the food, <laughs> the dehydrated food. Oh. That- <laughs> I really feel like we should look at some of this stuff and like potentially get it no. just to test it out. No. I'm j- I'd like not actually. No. I, I'm not, I'm not the sure. The damn cast already did that. that. Oh, did they? <laughs> yeah, they got the Jim Baker bucket of food. Oh, oh no. It is not good. <laughs> well, you didn't tell me about that. All right. Then we don't have to do it. We don't well, have to torture are, ourselves. Well, they didn't get the coffee. <laughs> there, there, really, there are several companies in the United States that deal with dehydrated meal kits and dehydrated Well, the thing is, whatever. it is, it and, is smart and, to and, have and, food and in your they're, house. They're pretty awful. I think there's maybe one or two. can be used in emergencies in case of, like, yeah. an earthquake or something where, like, you're stuck in your house. Like, it is good to have, like, provisions. Like, think about schools. You have the packs that's, like, for emergency. Your earthquake kit. Exactly. That's right. Everybody needs a five gallon tin of dehydrated pinto beans. The end times. (laughs) It's for a natural disaster. Well, you can always use military rations too, right? Yep. Not the not the not the American ones. Though. You use the French military rations. Oh, it's actually good food, apparently. Because <laughs> you know the French is that we're not going to eat this crap. <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of days. At least have something good to go out exactly. on. Exactly. <laughs> Croissant with your coffee? No, really. While we went for Argument? Yeah. Are we good? No, I'm kind of like Chris. I, I really think, uh, I'm on Christina's side. I think we ought to get a hold of some of this stuff and taste that it. That was cursed, and I said we shouldn't. Oh, that's right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't worry, we sound our names sound the same. Yeah. Oh god, we do this live on the air. No, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, the only thing is I'd maybe get like two packets of coffee. I don't want a two gallon bucket. Uh, the whole thing you gotta sell no. them individually in packets. No, they they want their full money's worth. Alright. Moving on. Alright. Now, this isn't quite as funny, but I've got some questions after this one for you guys. We can make it funny. <laughs> oh, trust me, you'll be able to. <coughs> Last week, in a move that should have happened a long time ago, Israeli national airline El Al announced that they would no longer accommodate ultra-Orthodox Jewish men who refused to sit next to women. Oh, yeah. In the past, the airline would encourage women to change their seats, decisions that have led to massive outcries and plenty of viral stories each time it happens. Why should women have to change their seats? Because some men have a hang-up about sitting next to them. Years of complaints and even a lawsuit didn't change their minds. Change didn't come until a tech company called Nice made this declaration. At NICE, we don't do business with companies that discriminate against race, gender, or religion. NICE will not fly at LL Airlines until they change their practice and actions discriminating women. That turned out to be very effective. The question for the airline became, which core group of customers do we upset? Ultra-Orthodox Jews or everybody else? The question has hovered in the air for a while, but the pressure was finally enough that they had to make a decision. Good. Good. They didn't even try to half-ass it. They always had the option of saying passengers who had their own rules about who they could or couldn't sit next to would just have to buy two seats. They didn't do that. They went straight to kicking those people off the flight. Yeah. Cool. LL says it would it will no longer facilitate discrimination and that any passengers refusing to sit to to sit next to another passenger will be immediately removed from the aircraft. Now, just a week after that, it happened on a different airline. 26 ultra-Orthodox Jews said they couldn't sit by women due to a religious rule, delaying the Austrian Airlines flight from Israel's Ben Gurion Airport by 40 minutes. This delay caused several passengers to miss their connecting flights, and the flight only took off after a couple of women changed, changed seats by, at the captain's request, presumably just because it was more important to get to their destination than put up a fight. Now... Do you think these airlines should remove these passengers if they won't sit in their seats due to faith-based sexism? Yes. And should these passengers get a refund? No. I, I think they should just upgrade the women to first class. <laughs> well, yeah, but sometimes you can't. You, <laughs> yeah. You, you, can't, you don't space. necessarily have first class yeah. or you have necessarily the space. Oh, sometimes oh. ultra-Orthodox Jews take it to ridiculous level. I have seen ultra-Orthodox Jews cover themselves in plastic bags, like in a, in a, in a plastic envelope, because according to their religion, they're not supposed to go near a cemetery as well knowing that the flight actually flies over a cemetery so they're protecting themselves in plastic somehow to protect themselves from the grave sucking influence but of the if cemetery. you're if you're 30,000 feet in the sky that means on the ground you're closer to cemeteries uh, I'm not sure what the how high the influence yeah. of the cemetery is but well, according to these people apparently it's bad but my question is why isn't this taken care of at the when the tickets are purchased and they have to reveal that they've got you know they've, they've got this, this I was going to say problem but they have this religious objection and that's when it should be taken care of when they say we've got 20 six men they can't sit next to women we're going to have to buy extra seats in order to to do that but we'll pay we'll pay for the seats i think that's one of the things you mentioned but for it to to um, not become apparent at the time of boarding i think is is the fault of the air fault mm -hmm. of the airlines but i don't know how I, I don't know how it all works it's just a yeah a guess like, my... i it's like imagine so a racist person going on, but I'm not sitting next to a black person. Like, no, that person gets kicked off and you don't get a refund. Yeah. yeah. You're an asshole. Yeah, well, that's, you know, religion, I guess, religious preferences have always taken um, precedence over But what if that person's race? a really no, I, orthodox I Mormon and is like, black people are bad. They aren't holy. Uh, for, so I'm not sitting by them. That could be religious. Well, if, if, yeah. you, if, if you're that orthodox of a Jew, Shouldn't you be riding a donkey across exactly. your destination like anyway, instead of taking a plane? I mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> if you're that old school. <laughs> yeah, but I agree. I think, you know, the one way to handle it would have been to buy buy the ticket, you know, 
next to you so that you don't disturb everybody else. But I think the right decision was made. You know, it's um, you know who's, yeah. who, who's, who, who, are, who are your passengers? Or, or you could have put it back in the, in the back of the plane. You know, the last three seats by the toilets and the engines. See, you know? <laughs> I, I think, and also in a situation where the women do have to move, like in this one we're talking about, because they just needed to leave. Yeah. I would refund the women. Yeah. I'd yeah. like, you were sorry. You had to move seats. We we're super sorry. These guys are assholes. So we're giving you money back. And I'd like to know what happened to those people that missed their connecting flights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah exactly. Like, that could be some serious things. Like, you don't know what they're going to. But if you're going like, to seriously. If you're gonna start refunding the women that have been inconvenienced and that have to move by that, you might as well just not allow these guys to come on because you're losing it from a business point of view. You're, yeah. you're losing a, 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 a flight a payment for a flight from one person or the other. Mm-hmm. So you might as well, you know, the, the hassle of having a guy pay and go on and change your seating arrangement yeah. or have the woman come on, sit down, and everything's fine. But at the same time, like, say they're, like, if they buy their, like, 26 tickets online, they don't have a section for what religion are you and what restrictions do you follow? Mm-hmm. Maybe well, they can put them in a kennel if underneath it's, there. If it's from Israel... <laughs> You know, you can and this has been a, 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 an ongoing problem. You know, it, it might be might be worth it to you know for people to say here, here, we, we were a, a group of twenty six ultra orthodox, and here's our here's our situation. It seems as though they should be able to you know to say these are our needs and how can you accommodate us. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a it's a sensitive topic. It, it is a very touchy bit. topic because then. Yeah. Almost guaranteed, as soon as you start get granting some special little, you know... Privileges to one religion, yeah. other religions come in and be like... And not even just other religions, goes, just like other people be like, oh, well, I have this thing. It goes right back to what I've been saying for a while now. Eventually, it's going to come to a time where some rights are going to have precedence over others. Well, There's going to be a scale. I, what I'm saying is, if you've got these 26 guys and they say, we can't... Oh, yeah, for sure. Them, but we will buy the additional seats if you exactly. can't seat us all together and there are two guys you know and the aisle seat is open we'll buy that seat yeah, to ensure sure. and and I think that's that's fine and also because I don't really know how close can they be to yeah I was wondering the same is thing is one seat between you enough yes. or do they yeah. need no, that one seat bet- yeah one seat between you is enough you, can, okay. you just there's, can't there's be need. physically it's a possibility of, of touching okay wow. so there just has to be you can't touch right you can't touch there's okay. an even easier way to get all around us right you just tuck to tell the ultra orthodox Jews, get over your stupid Bronze Age religious crap. Well, it's stupid. Get over it. Women are people. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Cooties or, aren't real. Either exactly. that or buy your own airline. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> Men only airline. Air yeah. Jew. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But I don't know. I have we heard. Have, have we heard of any other? Um, groups of people who have had one restriction or another that have caused difficulties, or has it just mainly been the Orthodox, ultra ultra, ultra Orthodox Jews? You know that I don't know, but that'd be interesting to it's look into. Question. Yeah, it's a good yeah. question. I don't know because some of the, I guess the Saudis are okay, but they they buy their own planes. So cool. Are we done? Interesting. We're done. Yeah. We're done. Well, thank you, Kirsten. So let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking to Scott Marshall about Love Explained. Woohoo! Feel all lovey dovey now. <laughs> so stay with us. Hi, I'm the Supreme Irreverend Dr. Randy Tyson from the Legion of Reason Diversion. Join me and my co hosts, Christine Shelska, Twyla, and Nate Phelps, as we explore issues at the intersection of atheism humanism, and skepticism. Topics range from alternative medicine to the interference of religion in public policy. We often have special guests to help us understand the topic du jour. Previous guests include biologist Jerry Coyne, ex-Muslim author Ali Rizvi, philosopher Peter Bogosian, and the late physicist Victor Stanger. You can watch us on the Legion of Reason YouTube channel or subscribe to the audio version through your favorite podcatcher such as iTunes or Stitcher. And don't forget to like the Legion of Reason Facebook page. A Canadian, a New Yorker, and a Southern Belle walked into a podcast. And all hell broke loose. Seriously, though, what happens when we three ladies get together? Well, definitely a lot of talking. And accents. Funny accents. 
Well, I don't have an accent, but my co-hosts sure do. We mix North, South, and the Great White North together for two hours of pure secular discussion. Nothing is off limits. From goofy religions like Scientology, woo like ghost hunting and alternative medicine, to hardcore history, hermeneutics, sex, and science, we cover it all. What the heck is a hermeneutic? Well, it's not a guy named Herman who sings falsetto, that's for sure. Join Beth, Ashley, and myself, Deborah, every Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and we take you beyond the trailer park and bring the conversation to life. Join us live on YouTube and participate in the conversation via the Q&A system, or catch us later on Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, and Nobex. Visit www.beyondthetrailerpark.com for links to the show and our upcoming schedule. Bring your wine and sweet tea and settle in for fun facts and free thinking. We happily wear the explicit tag, though, so make sure to wash out your mouth with something tasty before listening. That's live at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Come give us a like and a share, no matter what type of accent you have. Exciting and new Come aboard We're expecting you And love Life's Perfect. Now joining us online is author Scott Marshall. He wrote a book called Love Explained. He's a snappy dresser and a snazzy dancer. Scott, thank you so much for joining us at Left of the Valley. Thanks, it's great to be here. Yeah, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Absolutely, absolutely. Scott, uh, you, you, you might be well-known in some of your circles, but you might not be as well-known up here north of the 49th. Might want to give you uh, give us a little chance to know you. you. Would you be so kind to give us a short bio as to who Scott Marshall is? Yeah, well, I've done lots and lots of different things. Um, a uh, retired technical writer, and I used to also used to uh, design video games and write uh, computer programs, and I write music, and I write magazine articles. Most of them were about movie technology, and uh, so uh, now that I'm retired and I have time on my hands, I decided to to solve the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and my first book about that is uh, is called Love Explained. It uh, tries to to capture the whole explanation of what love is and how it works which some people have said is one of one of the world's greatest mysteries it is an ambitious topic there's no doubt about that thanks so explain to us what is love should what I is play, love? should i be playing some ah. barry white when i do this <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's uh yeah, that's you know when I told some friends I was working on a book about relationships and about the demystified love, they said, "Well, the first thing you have to do is define what love is." And I just went, "Ha! Huh, I nailed that in the first chapter." Uh, but love, you know what? Uh, do you mind if I read the first uh, paragraph of the first chapter? By all means. It's called "What Is Love?" Okay, life is naturally competitive. Practically all living things are born antagonistic to each other with few exceptions we are to most other living things competitors predators prey or carriers of infectious disease sometimes however we cooperate we collect in groups of two or more to defend our territories mates or possessions to hunt uh, to gather food or hunt for prey and to defend ourselves and each other from enemies we presume antagonism but crave cooperation love is a switch it's the switch pulled in our brains that causes us to see another as friend instead of foe it comes with a feeling often a very powerfully pleasant sense of affection but understanding the function rather than the feeling is the key now in my book um i I don't just talk about romantic love uh i talk about all kinds of love uh all kinds of affection for parent and child for brother and sister for uh, friends, co-workers, and, uh, and buddies online, and all that sort of thing. Okay? So, so were you on Tinder for research? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, I don't do any Tinder at all. No, I didn't do that. But well, I started the book uh, four years ago. Most of the research was, um, you know, by reading other books about, uh, about love and affection. 
So, 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 why pick that subject? Why, why go for love? It's, it's, it seems like such a huge ambition right away out, out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't start out deciding I was going to write a book about a book about love. I started out. Um, it was just sort of by chance. Well, I like to solve difficult puzzles, puzzles and mysteries. Anyway, that's just just one of my hobbies. And I was at a, a gathering where people, new people were meeting each other. And somebody said, uh, we were talking to each other, and we were saying, uh, well, what is your superpower? What do you do well? You know, you could be uh, good at doing interviews on podcasts. <laughs> you could be a, a, you know, a good artist. You do good gardening, musician, whatever. And I thought about that. And I said, well, some people think I can fix anything. And the response to that was, aha, can you fix a broken heart? Ooh. Now, mm-hmm. a, yeah, a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, you got me there. I don't think I can do that. Uh, but uh, what I did was, hmm, that's a good one. I'll work, about, I'll work on that. <laughs> so I started to research it and, 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 and um, read some books, do a lot of thinking. And I realized that I had figured out things that other people hadn't figured out. And I thought that when I got, dug into it enough, I said, this ought to be a book. And I was telling people what I was discovering, and they they agreed. You ought to write a book about this. So I worked on the book literally for four years, and um, and I finished it and self published it, and you can buy it. And the the ultimate was that it got it got a really good review from one of the uh, you know, most uh, respected book review services, uh, Kirkus Reviews. Which is pretty amazing. Nice. That's awesome. That's very nice. Yeah. It's a, it, it, what's amazing is that out of a chance encounter and, and a chance remark, that it sparked your interest and your curiosity, you know, for you to delve into it and then produce something that's of benefit to so many people and and answers a lot of questions for people. That that to me, that's the amazing part of the whole story. I I, I love accidental happenings, <laughs> you know, and that certainly is one. And you love great names too, and he's got a good name. name, Scott right. Marshall is a great that's name. Right. Uh, people, people sometimes online think it's a fake name. No, really. <laughs> no, it's too cool. It can't be your real name. <laughs> so, 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 Scott, um, you know, this is this is an interesting topic because everybody talks love, everybody thinks about love and stuff like that. But we all seem to have a very different idea of what it is. So, if, if you were to explain. Oh, I don't know. Let's put a situation here. Let's put. Uh, I'm an alien. I just came down from uh, Omicron Persei Eight, and I landed. And I, I want you to explain to me what this love things you humans do is. What we say. Exalted leaders, the Earth messengers have arrived, bearing a peace offering from their weak and fearful government. Yeah, I'd say pretty much what I put in the first paragraph. That's that's kind of how I think. That's. Uh, I mean, ever since I was in uh, grade school, I used that that exact model that you're using of. Uh, of uh, a way to understand things, basically to see situations from the third person um, and get out of the forest uh, to see the trees. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I would say, okay, if the aliens were down and I wanted to explain something to them, how would I do it? And and that's a great uh, way to think about things. You, you put yourself in a third person instead of being stuck in the in the interactions you're you're in the middle of, and then you then you can see things, uh, see the big picture. So, uh, so yeah, I pretty much did that in the first, uh, you know, in the first yeah. chapter. It's, it's the uh, it's the switch in the brain that makes us cooperate instead of fight each other or be afraid of each other. And um, and okay, the next question an alien would ask would be, how does that switch work? Mm-hmm. <laughs> would that be a good <laughs> thing to cover? The um, the switch is based on a hormone hormone called oxytocin. And uh, I, I pretty much treat that as the linchpin of, uh, of the whole love mechanism in the brain. Um, and I don't know if it, yeah, it's, since it's audio only, you can't see the cover of my book is a picture of a, it's a it's a graphic of a heart that uh, one half of it is cut away, and you see these these gears, the mechanism inside the heart, in the other half. Um, and so, so the theme of the book is. This is this is the clockwork basically basically of the heart. This is how the heart works. Mm-hmm. Um, so the alien has asked me how does love work, and I tell him well, well there's this this hormone called oxytocin, 
And I have a, actually a whole chapter on hormones, and it's called well, The Language of Hormones. Mm-hmm. And it's about uh, what, what a hormone is. It's a message. That's a chemical message that's being transmitted from one part of the body and being picked up by one or more other parts of the body. And the, uh, the hormone oxytocin is a, well, really, the, a lot of the secrets about how love works came from listing the things that caused hormone and caused uh, oxytocin to be generated and the things that oxytocin does when it's picked up by other parts of the body. There, we have glands that secrete hormones, and we have receptors in various places of the body that uh, detect the hormones, and they perform basic uh, certain functions. So once you get the, once you identify the hormone of love as oxytocin, then all you have to do is identif- identify what secretes the hormone into the bloodstream, and what, uh, what parts of the body pick it up, mm-hmm. and what they do when they detect that hormone. Then you have all the answers, and the mystery of love is gone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, and that comes to another thing, is that people like mysteries yeah. uh, sometimes, or they want it to be mysterious. Because yeah. a few of the people, what I said, I'm solving the mystery of how love works, they say, oh, don't tell me. I want it to stay a mystery. <laughs> yes. You, you ever encounter that? Oh, yeah. Well, I usually oh. just encounter, God is love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting you mentioned that one, because... Uh, a couple months ago, I shared the, the book with some new friends I, I met, and one of them read the whole book, and she says, it's very interesting, and then she says, do you have, do you say anywhere in your book God, that God is love? Yeah. <laughs> At first, I thought, wait a minute, she just told me she read the book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was my first thought right there. <sighs> yeah, and so I thought about it for a few seconds, and I was I, pretty careful to avoid that kind of... Um, divisive statement in the mm-hmm. book because uh one thing that we can talk about is the fact that i made a decision to not mention religion mm-hmm. anywhere in the book and to not mention evolution anywhere in the book uh so that they the book would be you know friendly to people of either of those persuasions yeah. and um and so so i thought for a few seconds after i was asked if the book says that god is love and said well, there's already a book that says that. Uh, <laughs> oh, clever. You're so diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> That's diplomatic and yeah. clever. Yeah. But and, by not mentioning... And, and then I said, uh, well, you know, I I didn't put in my book what everybody says and what's in all kinds of other books and everybody sort of knows. I put in my book new things, mm-hmm. brand new ideas. Not the, It's not a rehash of old ideas. I was about to ask you, by not putting evolution in your book, are you not... Um, omitting an entire history of uh, how uh, our species came to express the feeling? Hmm. Well, it, you know, the, the funny thing is you don't need to. Hmm. And uh, evolution is actually between, my, between the lines all over the book. I just don't actually yeah. use those words. Yeah, totally. It's, it's, you can refer to things... And talk about it in a way that's not without like, using the exact yeah. You, you don't have like a graph and like yeah. have a whole chapter on evolution. But if you know what evolution is and you you understand it, you can read it and like read about the hormones and how it's used in the body and understand that evolution is how that came to be. Mm-hmm. How right. like the body like now is how as we have now. Yeah. But you don't need to necessarily be like. And let's break down every evolutionary step that it took to get here. Cause, and, and talking about love as it is now, I don't think you necessarily have to go into how we got here. Because people are wanting to know, okay, we're here now. What is this now? Yeah, but he, ex- he explains love on a very scientific, matter-of-fact kind mm-hmm. of way. And I think, I think uh, like you were, we were discussing about people you know, not wanting to know the mystery... Uh, he's he's taken out the mystery by doing by doing so. In state, maybe some people would even challenge that. Maybe you're removing some of the romance around the word. Uh, has that been some of the? Uh, have you had that kind of criticism about your book? Um, well, no one who's read the book has said that it was demystified in a way that reduced it. Okay. And one of the things that I, one of the encounters I had, because I talked about the book, and I, I 
floated uh, test balloons about the ideas in the book to various people over the years while I was working on it without giving away the, 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 the thesis mm-hmm. and uh, to see how they reacted. And, and you get uh, one of the standard reactions is that if you explain love in biological terms, you're reducing it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in other words, reductionism and things like that. Uh, so I kept that in mind as, as I was working on it. And, I'm, uh, and I made the point always to talk about how important love is, how valuable love is, how wonderful it makes us feel. And um, how, and it's a, it's a crucial function in in life because it it it, it helps us cooperate with each other, yeah. um, like as a tribe. It helps us um, get sex done, get reproduction <laughs> done. That's very important. And and it helps us take care of our children, even when they're being awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so it's an essential part of life, and. It feels great when it's working. Mm-hmm. So, where's the problem? You know, where's the problem of de- demystifying it? The promise of demystifying something is that you can be better at it if you understand how it works, mm-hmm. and and that's a holy mission. Okay. Do, do we, in in your book, do you get into how how your heart or how your emotions are are, are how you are attracted? To certain people or things, how how that connection, how the hormone works, is produced, how the choices, how 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 you make the choice that um, the unconscious choice that I love this person but I don't love that one. It goes sort of to the old saying: the heart wants what the heart yeah, wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So some of that we don't have agency in um, who we choose. That's. That's a, that's a frustrating thing for all of us. That we don't actually choose who we're going to be attracted to. <laughs> no, we don't. Well, there is we a just, choice, but it's so it's it's sub- subconscious, I guess. And yeah. we, this feeling of attraction, and we don't always know why we're attracted to somebody that we may not like all that much. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we discover who we're attracted to. We don't yeah. choose. Yeah. Yes. Who we're, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I and uh, and some of, there's some biology behind that too. Um, because uh, I actually go into uh, there are a couple chapters that that cover the uh, the functions of attraction, and of course, you know, my book is it's it's about the love for for family and children, and you know, your children, and all those things, and for parents. Uh, so it, it hits on the common things, and and the whole book isn't about isn't really about the romantic love so much, um, but and you know, attraction can be can be very it's this is a bad word it can be very base and not romantic it's just uh, just powerful and non-romantic mm-hmm. track can exist too but there's a lot of things going on with that um and then there there are learned preferences like um and their differences. I think one of the most important uh, factors in romantic attraction I do mention this in the book is that we're attracted to we well, you know how a lot of people say Opposites attract. Yeah, yeah, that's an old cliche, and I yep. think it's, I think it's wrong, actually, and because uh, what, uh, what's uh, uh, an example of opposites attract might be like a, a blonde and a brunette being attracted to each other. Okay, uh, can, on the claim that those are opposites, or sometimes you have a skinny person and a, and a heavy person and. So on and so forth. They're so tall and they're short. They call it opposites. But at, at the same time, there's uh, attraction to people who are like ourselves. So how do you reconcile all that? Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the answer is we are attracted to people who are similar but different. You, we need both of those. Mm. Um, and uh, and the difference is we're we're attracted to features in in someone. Who are who we don't have in ourselves, but we admire. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, and that's been misinterpreted as opposites attract. Like if, uh, say, if if somebody, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the shallow features, but this works on deep features. If somebody, if a, if a guy likes blondes, chances are he's probably not a blonde himself. So he's somehow probably learned. Uh, 
that blondes are attractive for whatever reason, somehow that, you know, it's culturally, whatever. And, um, and that's become, uh, you know, what he's interested in. Uh, and, uh, that happens with eye colors, with, you know, with, uh, and with personality traits. Uh, we tend to be attractive to, to, to features, abilities in others that we don't have in ourselves, but we admire. Can we also okay. sometimes be influenced by um, cultural pressures? I mean, for example, we were talking about blondes. You know, they've been saying forever, blondes have more fun and, and stuff like Actually, that. Actually, it's redheads have more fun. Well, yes. Y- yeah. <laughs> redheads are feisty and, and stuff like is that. Is that a redhead speaking? But of course she is. I'm technically a blonde, but I've been a redhead since I was like eight. <laughs> <laughs> really? I dye you my color, hair. You color your hair? Yeah. Since you were eight? Well, my my hair, I have, I'm, I've Polish descent and my hair has been, it was like straw. So actually okay. dyeing it um, helped kind of make it. it better. Make it smoother? Yeah. So, yeah. And I have a sister who's a professional She's got hair hairdresser. Hair. I, have, I have an older sister who um, is a professional hairdresser. So I, it wasn't oh. like I was doing it myself. So. Yeah. So may I ask when you first started having that done? What was your reason? Oh, I hated my hair and I wanted to like it. I see. Yeah. You hated your hair. It was yeah. what, dirty blonde you said? Yeah, it was it wasn't like a like a platinum or like really blonde. It was yeah, it was like a dirty blonde. Yeah. But yes, you must have seen redheads yes. where you, and yeah. you thought, and Oh, that's really I, cool. I want to be like that. I it started like I had hair and then I had like red streaks. Like uh, the first time I got red streaks and then I was like, Oh, I like this and then I just I wanted red and I wanted red hair. And mm-hmm. yeah, I just loved it. I don't yeah. like I can't like be like look back to one specific time and be like, Oh, I wanna look like that person. I just always loved red hair. You know, I did the same thing with my chest hair. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Started with streaks. Started with streaks. <laughs> Did you start doing fun patterns too, Kevin? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so Scott, what's what's the most intriguing thing that you found out, or something that was totally unexpected that you didn't expect to to find in your research? Okay, yeah. One of the one of the things that I came up with was which didn't directly come from the research, but it was a it was a big aha from watching lots of things, uh, uh, watching people interact and, and watching videos of people interact, and uh, and that is the fact that we are born. This is somebody might might claim that this is my opinion because it's a brand new discovery about behavior and it and and the book covers biology and psychology sociology and philosophy in many different levels of the, and this is a kind of a psychology thing that we are born instinctively knowing how to receive love but we have to learn how to give love okay and uh, i think that's a brand new idea i was really i, really I was really proud sense. of coming up with that <laughs> Uh, well, but I looked it, it around and studied things, watched people, and I went, "Wow!" And it seemed to be consistent. So, so it's in the book. Do, uh, do you have anything you would like me to clarify about that? Is it is it self protection? Is it fear of getting hurt? Is it vulnerability? What, what do you attribute to that? Um, let's see. It's well. I, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that, that question exactly as it's asked. Oh, that's okay. Answer anything you want. <laughs> it's your book, and that's where we're, we're here to learn. So don't worry about the question. Just give us what you got, kiddo. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just people don't know what to do to others to, uh, to show love for them, and that it's often very clumsily done. But when somebody... Uh, shows love to us and it's and it's done well we receive it automatically because we we have uh, all the sensory apparatus to to pick up love and and the the ways to analyze how we're being treated to, to understand that um we can make mistakes but it's built into us and uh, you know you know the most important part the most basic part of love and affection is 
is the loving touch. Yeah, I was about to say physical contact, <laughs> like a hug. <laughs> or like what we're doing right now, just sitting here and your legs are all my Hey, lap. hey, 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 you so, guys are so, down, so, Kevin. So, so, so perhaps the, the receiving of love, it, 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 once one receives and feels the love, it takes a while for that to hormonally and emotionally transmute itself into giving that well, one has I to think be stimulated a like but a baby has knows be, how to accept yeah. love it cries but it doesn't kids have to learn how to how to reciprocate that like kids yeah. our kids are selfish assholes until yes. they learn to like play nicely with other kids like kids don't instinctually know how to be nice so it's partly a learned res- a learned response after being able to absorb love or experience mm-hmm. and love. and see it, other people doing it. I'm assuming. Well, when you're a baby, you get a boob in the face every couple hours for feeding. <laughs> eh? You want to keep it. I understand why they're selfish. I want to keep it too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but well, um, you know, babies, um, you know, they they need the boob in the face, <laughs> they, and they need delicious milk. You know, they need that, and they also need uh, eye contact mm-hmm. with their mother. And they need to be held affectionately in, in ways that, that aren't painful. Yeah. Um, and uh, a mother is, is hopefully is someone who's lived uh, long enough to know how to do those things, how to, how to touch somebody without hurt, hurting them and making them feel good, how to touch affectionately. And, and the baby just receives that instinctively because it has all the, uh, all the systems of uh, uh, the neural networks are you know sensory systems to pick all that up it can taste the uh taste the sweet milk and so on and so forth uh but the baby is also uh likely to do something obnoxious yeah that's going to turn the mother off and say i don't want to have anything to do with you now because you're making me miserable um and it's uh and this i hope i have a whole chapter in the book that uh goes right into this and it's called life's circle of love Mm -hmm. okay and it begins with the birth process uh as uh, when a baby comes comes uh, comes out of the mother it's uh by default it's very painful obviously because it's stretching the skin and, and uh and tearing and whatever but at the same time there are some uh mechanisms that cause the stretching of the birth canal to generate oxytocin okay and so so even though the mother might experience some pain and, and oxytocin actually reduces uh pain she's going she's being primed hormonally to look at what's coming out of her as friend and not foe is not some kind of horrible parasite coming out of her body that she has to ew, get rid of oh, she's on, primed hormonally you, 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 we're talking about a natural birth here, but what about something like a, a, C, a, a, C-section. a C-section? Does that mean that uh-huh. she might, does she have the same kind of hormonal level um, that, that that's happening to her as well? Or is that bypassed? Is there any research that, that do, that's done on that subject? Yeah, it bypasses it. Uh. And, um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, the, the common terminology is that, uh, is that, it, is that it, it might take longer for the mother and child to bond mm-hmm. if you haven't gone through all the you know, the processes that have, been, have that have been happening for millions of years. If you circumvent that, then you can interrupt the bonding. Hmm. Uh, especially one of the worst things we do in uh, in the uh, the natal ward is you know, in a lot of hospitals, and it's it's less now, fortunately. Is as soon as the baby comes out, they isolate it yeah. and put it in in a you know a little yeah. crib or something, and separate the mother and the child, and then they prevent the bonding. And that's that's there have been complaints about that for decades, um, and uh, and there's good explanations scientifically, hormonally, and biologically of why that's a terrible thing to do. To a mother and a child to separate them like that, mm-hmm. um, but um, uh, f- from the beginning, you know, the first thing the baby does after it comes out and it gets hungry is it's going to feed, and it needs to feed uh, uh, most of the time. You know, naturally, it's it's feeding from its mother, and so the baby is, you know, so let's call that the baby receiving pleasure, which is holding. And sucking, you know, sucking on the nipple. But what some babies do if they're too hungry is they suck too hard. They cause pain for the mother. Mm. This is what I mean 
and, and this this is what I mean uh, by not knowing how to give love. Yeah. Because because uh, uh, suckling is very pleasurable for the mother, and it generates lots of oxytocin. As long as it's not done too hard, then then it becomes painful. So the baby has to learn to to not cause pain because once it causes pain, uh, a mother is just <clears throat> chances are the mother is going to deny the baby of more breastfeeding, mm-hmm. and so they, in, in that process, the baby that's the baby's first lesson on how to consider the response of the person that you're that you're interacting with. Yeah, the grown men that still haven't learned that lesson. And, and there are there are a lot of permutations on that. There's a lot of mothers who uh, don't want to breastfeed, and so they go to bottle feeding right away. Mm-hmm. There are mothers who really never wanted to have that child, so they don't give love. There, you know, there are mothers who experience some pain during breastfeeding, but do everything they can to overcome it, and and they take the responsibility so that the baby just keeps feeding normally uh, until it gets teeth and at that point you know know, there's a a change so all of these ideals of giving and receiving love are wonderful but all of the permutations are many times what causes um, differences in how we relate to the world and how we reform form relationships with other people you know I hear that that right Scott yeah it's uh and uh yeah you're calling them differences I would sometimes say that they're compromised Okay. Um, they're they're no longer optimal if okay. uh, if we if we learn a way to uh, to uh, to interact that's not not the way we're naturally set up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I hear that uh, when women are experiencing pain, uh, they put uh, cabbage leaves in their bra. Have you guys ever heard of that? No. No, no, I heard cool of it. Down. Where did you hear that? Well, apparently, apparently, it helps soothe the, the <laughs> breast and the knee. Did you hear no, it no, yeah. no. But I just thought that that'd just be my luck. Finally, take a bra off. There's a freaking salad yeah. in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, you know that that doesn't teach the baby anything though. Mm. Yeah. The lesson for the baby so. is if you hurt me, then you won't get the the goodies I have for you. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, one of the best lessons in life. Scott, uh, next week we're we're talking to Dr. Jerry Coyne about um, free will, and you 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 describe love as an uh, as a hormone and all that. But uh, could you, in your research, could you say that there is an element of free will in how people fall in love, or is it purely a biological thing? Um, we have some influence over it. Uh, now, you know, in the in the in the most extreme. Uh, concept of free will. We, I don't think we do really have free will, uh, but I'm a compatibilist where I, where I think we, even though it's a deterministic universe, that we have that we have a, a free will in in any way that matters. Uh, but you're asking, I think, about the that the earlier question of um, yeah, can we decide who we love? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, to some degree, we can. To some degree, we can't. There are certain circuits in the brain that that are pretty much set for birth that that are not amenable to change. Uh, and now you're getting into the you know we're getting into the problem of, um, uh, for example, of people who want to change their uh, sexual preference. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the best evidence we have for that is that you can't. <laughs> um, but I think that we can re- there the other things like whether you whether we uh, are attracted to blondes or brunettes, for example, uh, that is a learned response, and I think that can be unlearned. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's yeah. a, that's an interesting answer because I guess the, the follow up question to that is uh, if we have maybe a slight element of, of of will, then what happens when? You're breaking up with somebody when you run out of love. When you decide you know you're no longer attracted to this, to this or that person, then what yes. exactly happens in your brain at that point? Um, okay, what's the last thing you said? I didn't quite get that. Uh, what 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 happens in your brain? What happens in your mind? Uh, what what's the, the? I guess describe it to me when when somebody falls out of love, <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, when like uh, if I said to my girlfriend. I don't love you anymore, and yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, 
I was bit, uh, and that was an honest statement. What happened to me? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh-huh. you, you've, you've, been, you've been in love with this person for, I don't know, X amount of years, and everything's right. going fine, and all of a sudden you wake up a couple of mornings or after a little while and you say, no, I'm done with this person. I, I would question that because I don't think that necessarily ever happens suddenly. I think falling out of love with someone is a is a gradual process. Well, I, I guess it depends on the individual, I guess. Some people it seems rather sudden, others it seems to be over the time. It's a little bit more like, you know, it's the little things that count. Mm-hmm. It can be. Uh, but the, the, the way I paint the picture in my book is that love is is to a great de- degree synonymous with trust, okay? Yeah. And uh, uh, attraction is something else. Uh, uh, although, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, a commonality there between attraction and, and love, but um, you can still be attracted to, to someone you've fallen out of love with, for example. So are you, but, are you essentially saying when you're you saying you don't love somebody anymore, you're essentially saying I don't trust you anymore? That's right. Wow. Yeah, trust is a big part of that. And there's a there's an example in my book. Uh, the format of my book is I start start each chapter with um, uh, an illustrative example. And so there are lots of examples in the book. Some of them are from my life. Some of them from are from other people's lives. Um, most of those are uh, I've changed the names. But in this in this one example, there was a couple who was in love, and they were married. And they uh, and every night when they got to bed together, the first thing they did was they held each other as closely as they possibly could, wrap, wrapping their arms and legs around each other. Um, and uh, which is, you know, when you're in love, when everything is clicking, it's an incredibly beautiful moment to have as much skin contact as you can with a person that you love and then one day uh, and he was going to uh, uh, to uh, try to remember the example he was going to uh, he, he had inherited some money and he was going to deposit it in the bank mm-hmm. and when he picked up the money he went to the racetrack and blew it all oh god and yeah I wouldn't cuddle him either because yeah, no. he wanted to, he wanted to run it up. He, you know, he thought, "Oh, I could make more money." And he came home and he told his wife that. And that night, when they got to, into bed together, he went over to her to give her that, give her the body contact, and she recoiled from him and pulled away and said, "That was like being clasped by an opt- octopus." Let me show you what that felt like. And she uh, held him. The same way that she had held him before, but he felt that sort of terror of, of being consumed by an animal that's going to eat you. <laughs> wow. And so the same exact physical mm. action of holding someone as closely as you could to make all your body, body contact changed from something wonderful to something horrible because he had betrayed her and she had lost trust for him. Mm. Yeah, she was essentially saying, "I don't trust you can make good decisions for our financial future." Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I wouldn't say, I would say in that moment she didn't have control over that necessarily, mm. because trust isn't something that you can necessarily choose to have all the time. Like you can't, mm-hmm. I can't be like walking down the street and be like, "Okay, I trust this random person." I like, and I, you can't necessarily make yourself feel that. Right. Sometimes that seems to come from instinct. Yeah. You you know somebody will just say something, and then you have this feeling like you can trust them, mm-hmm. or or they'll look at you in a certain way, and you have this feeling that they're that you can't trust them. And um, I I think earlier when we were talking about free will, I think this might be one area you, you were saying it's it's not necessarily we don't have any free will, but we also don't have full like we can do whatever we want. Mm-hmm. I think this might be an area where. We have the free will to make a choice. Okay, do I want to rebuild trust with this person? Like, I want right. that feeling again, so I'm going to... Give him or her a second chance. Well, no. The thing is, what you'd have to do is start from the basics again and rebuild that trust. But that is a choice you can make. Because mm-hmm. if we could just... Okay, I'm, I, I don't trust this person anymore. I'm just going to go with my feelings and just... 
okay, well, I can't love you anymore. But it's, sometimes it's the choices we make. I want to I wanna love this person, so I'm going to pull myself out on a limb. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, you mean you want this person to love, yeah. 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 Right. Um, now, uh, you touch on something really interesting, because I, I do have a chapter on how to restore lost, lost love. Oh, good. And one of the uh, really important ways to do that is uh, with crying. And, you know, crying is mysterious, because we have... Uh, tears of regret and tears of uh, joy and things like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've, I've been wondering about this for years. What is what is crying all about? Why do we cry? Uh, why do we why do we cry? And because of things that are good and things that are bad. Why do we cry when we meet you know we meet somebody who we missed? Uh, yeah. And um, and I and the answer to crying is from the hormones. Because crying does something really interesting, uh, and I'm talking about mostly crying in humans. Uh, I don't know much about the animals, uh, and you know, I, uh, I'll stick with the humans though. When we cry, our tear ducts are outputting the breakdown hormones, uh, the breakdown products of stress hormones. And that fact is mind-blowing when you think about what that means. Mm -hmm. Because when we cry, what the body is doing, it's dumping stress hormones. Really? Yeah. Stress hormones are uh, the fight-or-flight instinct. Mm -hmm. In other words, and fight-or-flight means means fear or hostility or aggression. So... um, when the body decides it doesn't want to have, because the stress hormones are toxic, they actually make us sick. And when the body decides not to have stress hormones anymore, it's made a decision that it's um, it's not going to fight anymore. That the the battle is over. And so it so the tear ducts, <laughs> it's so amazing. The tear ducts are breaking down the stress hormones, removing stress from our body. And they're doing it in a way that's visible, that's communicated mm. to other people. So when you see somebody crying, they're telling you that that's a message to you that they don't want to fight you anymore, that they are not going to see you as enemy, that they're going to see you as friend now. Uh, it's, it, that, there's some variations on that, but that's the most important mm. uh, function. Like, uh, say... Uh, the tears of joy that you meet somebody that you you haven't seen for several years, for example, you know those those airport videos of, yeah. of people greeting their relatives and everybody's crying. Well, having uh, having people you love away from you, being away from people you love, is stressful. Mm-hmm. And when you're reunited, the body doesn't need that stress anymore, and it empties it amazingly through the tear ducts. And when you do that, then the person that you love sees that you're doing that. Yeah. And it sends them the message, ah, we can resume our friendship now. I don't have to be tense about our separation. Is that making sense? No, yeah. it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Good. Good. So, um, so if you've lost your trust for your romantic, you know, if your romantic partner has lost, lost their trust for you, then... Um, well, you're saying you're sorry. You can't just, I'm sorry. You can't just say that mechanically. You have to say it in a way that means it. You have to promise you'll never do it again. And then if you also cry, it means I don't want us to fight anymore. I want us to be together. Mm. And if your partner sees you crying, that that gives the message that it's real. Uh, now we get into crocodile tears. Can they be faked? Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. We sh- I don't think we should obsess about whether or not somebody is, is making crocodile tears because um, that takes pretty good acting. That's a, that's a way to cynically reject somebody who, who you still don't trust, I guess. Mm-hmm. Is that making sense? Yeah. No, that makes mm-hmm. perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. The, the accusation that somebody is, is, is making crocodile tears is very unkind. And uh, you, pretty, you you ought to give them the, the benefit of the doubt, but you know some people 
are uh, bullshit artists, and you can't trust them. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes the, the, the crying, it, it, it can be what you describe, but I think sometimes it's also a cleansing and a release to get the toxins out, to get the stress out. And, and right. once you do have a really good cry, you can take a deep breath and resolve, this person really isn't worth my trust not worth my energy not worth the love that i have but i can now resolve to find that someplace else mm-hmm. and then you can move on mm-hmm. but i agree 100 percent with the yeah. fact that the 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 tears are are a release of stress and, and toxins what the outcome will be i think maybe is up to you know that particular person and where he or she is in mm-hmm. in life at that point mm-hmm. it's really fascinating because i'm um, with you talking about crying is showing trust it, it so, um, so recently a couple months ago I um my cousin who was also one of my best friends uh passed away and at his funeral um one thing about my family is they're very religious and I I couldn't cry at his funeral like I, I just I couldn't cry you wanted to or you oh could... yeah yeah I wanted to but I but you I, couldn't bring yourself to do it no okay and afterwards, I went, I got my, um, another cousin of mine who is also one of, I'm very close to, and I'm like, okay, I need you to come with me to a secluded room, and I just need to cry. Okay. And it's really interesting hearing you talk about, like, yeah, I, I don't trust my family to cry around. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting, because I'm like, I searched out someone who I did trust, who I knew right. I could cry with. Right. Yeah, with your family, you needed... To, to keep the armor in place. Yeah. 100%. So what does that say about guys? Because I know for, for a lot of guys, for example, even though they might have the feeling that they might want to show, social. show vulnerability, but even growing, in front of their girlfriends, like, Growing up, a lot it. of guys here, you're not allowed to cry. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So I think with a lot of guys, they don't learn the mechanism necessarily of bringing down that armor mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. they're allowed well, to. Well, part of what being a guy is is uh, is to com- is to be competitive with other guys. Yes, and I think that's instinctive too. Sometimes, uh, as it's described as um, as we're a tournament species, which is kind of like uh, you know, it's it's like like rams that where the males the rams you know butt each other's heads until one of them is so dazed he can't go on anymore, and then then. The winning ram gets the uh, uh, gets to mate with the with the mm-hmm. females in the group, uh, and there's some of that in 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 humans too, and it's it's mostly it's mostly in men, and it's one of the reasons why men aren't aren't as affectionate to each other as mm-hmm. uh, say women are to each other is because men are competing with each other all the time, to some degree. Oh yeah. Um, and so so if a man cries. It sends a signal to other men that you're vulnerable and weak, and uh, and they can uh, basically it's it's a sign of weakness to other men. Yeah, and not not just necessarily other men. Also, some sometimes you're women too. Mm. I'll have some women that'll look at you and say, "What are you, baby?" <laughs> it's like, interesting. Up, I I right? personally love like if a guy is comfortable with himself and like is like can cry. I'm like that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, so some women react, others <laughs> don't, right? So. Yeah, it's changing. Yeah. It's changing socially for you sure. You had a question, um, Scott. So, in in what ways or way has writing the book changed you? Your either your understanding of it, or emotionally, That's or the relationships that 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 you have. May, maybe one or, or two ways that that have been significant changes. He's like the love guru now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's start to love well, it's, uh, as when I was midway through the book, I. I Decided to see that movie. <laughs> I anticipated that I'd be looked at that way, and as the whole idea of being a love guru has such an ugly uh, <laughs> history, you know, because because most of these love gurus gurus are, are full of nonsense, and they either they regurgitate the same old crap that, you, that you've heard over uh, over and over again over the years. Uh, or else they make up new useless crap. 
So I don't know if I want to be called that because, uh, but that that one of, I think one of the problems with marketing my book is that is that people think that it's just going to be another self help book, mm-hmm. and regurgitating the same old nonsense. Yeah. And uh, and it's been a, a little bit hard to express that I've come up with brand new things, um, brand new ideas that there, I wouldn't have written the book if it was just the same old stuff. Uh, so Scott, you, maybe you've asked me a personal we'll, question. Put, we'll put you to a test on this. We'll put you to a test. Here, here's something from my my own life. Here, um, you see, I've been having a fight with my girlfriend, right? Because you know, you, in the middle of the night, you get up, you use the bathroom, and I left the toilet seat up. It's always the, the small sin. things, right? It's always the small things. <laughs> and she's been yelling at me to put down the toilet seat. So to give her a lesson, what I've been doing is I've been putting the plunger in the toilet. So when she goes to the bathroom in the middle of the oh night. Oh, my God. Now she kicked me out of the house, and now she's sleeping with the plunger. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm you kidding. Know, I'm kidding. When it comes to uh, what's better, a man or a plunger, there's no contest. <laughs> the plunger wins. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, thank so, you. So, so, so Scott, I, I, I want you to, if you can... I want. I really in, in, um, would would like to know in in what ways writing the book has changed you. Oh. Any views or any emotions or any way of looking at love? Well, well the discovery that uh, that we have that we have to learn how to give love, uh, even though we naturally know how to receive love, is is pretty amazing. But the um, it's pretty useful. Uh, but the. Uh, but the other thing, and I haven't actually mentioned it yet, is that uh, in order for someone to love you, uh, you need them to to trust that you will make them feel good and you will not make them feel bad. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. like the most essential principle. And uh, and so so when I'm interacting with people that I you know that I care about uh, liking me. I just make sure I don't make them feel bad, whatever I, you know, as if possible, and I want to do things to make them feel good. And and you can do that in a million different ways with everybody you meet every day. Mm. Um, and I, currently, I am not in a romantic relationship because uh, I don't think I'd date anyone who disagreed with any of my <laughs> principles. <laughs> uh but you know, I, I interact with uh, uh, with my mother and my my uh, uh, and my siblings, and I, and I have a son, and I have family, and I have people who I, I hang out with, mm-hmm. and I use the same principles with all of them. And you know, love is is a kind of an, an extreme word, and I really mean just affection and getting along with people. Uh, to different degrees where you know uh, romantic uh, love is the most extreme in one direction and then uh, but you you can you know have you can love your drinking buddies for example or you you can love your you, you know buddies in whatever way your your uh, the people you hang out with or your coworkers you can say I love my coworkers and you're not going overboard and you know and saying you want an intimate relationship with them but the same principles apply you want the people you're close to the uh to feel good uh, and to trust that you will make them feel good and to trust that you will not make them feel bad and that that's a that's a distillation of something that you can apply every day to every interaction you have with everyone you meet Mm. and that's a good way to finish this scott thank you so much for being on the show with us today but if people want to find out more about your book and about you where can they reach you uh, well, you can find me on uh, on Facebook. Uh, uh, just use my name, it's Scott Marshall. My name should pop up. I have a uh, uh, web page about my book, Love Explained, and I have another web page to talk about love. It's called How Love Works, mm-hmm. and I'm also on Twitter. What's your handle on Twitter? It's, it's just my name. That's <laughs> Scott nice. Marshall. Perfect. Scott, yeah. thank you so much for, for doing this for us today. Before I let you go, i got to have you say, Hi, I'm Scott Marshall, and I took a left at the valley. Hi, I'm Scott Marshall, and I took a left at the valley. <laughs> that was Scott Marshall. What an interesting oh, conversation this I, was. I feel like I've learned so much. I know. Uh, if, like, you know, it's, it's one of those topics that, you know, everybody does it, everybody knows about it, but we actually don't. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it was very, very informative. 
Yeah, yeah. It, it really was. I mean, it, take, it takes a topic that we all think we know, mm -hmm. and he brought something really new to he it. He certainly did. Yeah, he certainly yeah did. very worthwhile conversation. I remember my first love. My mom called it puppy love, and my doctor thought it was an unhealthy attachment to a pet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> At least it wasn't a hamster. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll absolutely have to bring him back. This yes, oh, yes. Wow. There's so much more. Yeah, worthwhile book. like video game design. Yes. <laughs> Worth, yeah, worthwhile book to read. I might, uh, I might get that one. Yeah, I definitely I think, I think, buy it. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. And I'm literally gonna buy it and give it to my mom. And be like, mom, read this. Yeah. Understand that I can't choose who I love. <laughs> I hope it works. Well, thank you so much, ladies, and to our audience for joining us today on the yes. show. Well, sure. You can find us at leftatvalley.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, at LETV Podcast. You can send us an email at leftatvalley at outlook.com. Send your complaints to Nancy on the third floor. Just don't stand by the, the window. Send your love letters to Kristen and Christina. <gasps> yes! <laughs> and send your Civil War letters to... Yes. Send them to me. <laughs> Alex send them to Jones. Me. <laughs> to oh Alex Jones, exactly. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to see his response. If he does one, I just want to be like, uh, I wonder how he's going to twist it. Be like, they really had a civil war, guys. Well, sons it of was love in the too. heaven. Coming up next week, Professor Jerry Coyne is back. Oh, we talk about will. Do we have free will? And on no. the 21st, Eli Bosnick. I'm so yes. What a special guest. I bought some tranquilizer darts. Yes. I'll let you guys know why. And on the 28th, uh, we have Dr. Ben Davis comes back, and he's going to be talking to us about junk science. Remember when you talked to us about uh, nuclear power? This yes. time it's about junk science. Oh, I'm deal. excited. It's very exciting lineup, in as August, always, Kevin. We'll be talking to Anthony Magnabasco about street epistemology. And remember old friend Michael Sparks? Yes. Yeah. Michael Sparks is coming back as well. He's going to talk to us about politics and what's going on in the States. That's going to be an interesting day. And towards the end of the month, <laughs> we'll have the guy from Godless Cranium. It's a YouTube channel. I highly recommend you guys take a look at it. Hmm. It's really interesting. What is it, Godless Cranium? That's, I, a, that's the name of his character, I Godless know. Cranium. I think I watched those videos, actually. I'm like, I recognize that name. Yes. <laughs> I might even follow his channel. You probably do. Probably. Ah, uh, Thank you so much, ladies. Anything else we need to add before we close up? Um, go watch the net on Netflix. It's Do it. magical. Okay. But have some Kleenex with you because it's depressing, <laughs> but hilarious at the same time. <laughs> Especially for a straight white man. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Thank you so much, guys. Until next time. Skeptic and non-believer and infidel a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. Now let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, pun intended, I find it disgraceful. The thousands of children are raped by priests, and since they're holy men of God, they get away scot-free. And the Pope does his very best to keep it on the hush, don't want to affect business, he loves money too much. We know that they love the kids, but how the fuck can we protect them while they plan to molest them? We teaching them to respect them, respect them. Fuck that. The system is broke down, working backwards, and the only action of tactic I plan to practice now is to attack them. The parties of God's hands are bloodstained, millions of murders by believers, and they're all in God's name. And let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I 